and as you know, typically there's a there's a trickle in effect that occurs as well. Because you're an OG at this at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love I just it. To, I gotta click this button here. The panic button? You don't have to click the panic button. I gotta click the button that says, "Did you know we're recording?" Oh, <laughs> yeah. <that's, laughs> yeah. By the way, you are being recorded. Hey, crew, how's it going, everyone? Getting people in. I'm seeing faces. I love to see faces. Tracy. And I love, uh, I'm also seeing Jen in a different location than I've ever seen her before. David, I recognize that background. <laughs> Good deal. Yes, I'm seeing faces. I love it. We're going to give everyone. Yesterday. <laughs> Same yeah. message yesterday. We'll get to that uh, another day. Less important is cleaning up that bookshelf, but we'll get to that one day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll give everyone a second to jump in. And then we'll see how wonderful my um, emceeing skills are in terms of putting Joe in the spotlight and whatnot. I always seem to uh, flub that a little bit. It gets a little dicey sometimes. All good. It's a little dicey. Okay, so while we're trickling in, here's what I want for you guys to be thinking about. Joe's coming to talk to us directly about uh, essentially language of sales is the best way that I can kind of surmise it. Essentially, where are we having pain points in converting business? Where are people throwing up objections? We don't know what to say back to them. We're just kind of being outscripted by our clients. I'm hearing a lot of that going on. Um, and I'd love for us, as you are, are getting settled, as people are coming into the room, you are welcome to throw it out out loud with your voice, but you're also welcome to put it in the chat box. What are the objections? Where are you getting stumped? This can be on the buy side or the sales side. We're going to start to accumulate some of those for Joe to sink his teeth into. Don't be shy. And we're going to talk about objections in general. Yes. Love it. We're going to go, we're going to go to that. So any pushback you're getting, and, and here's the thing of it. If you don't put anything in the chat box, I know you're lying. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to just fine. ask because I can talk faster than I can type. Is that what okay? Yeah, David. <laughs> All right. So I'm getting a lot of people right now. Um, they're pretty much, they want to, they're thinking of going, but their hesitation is right now with the holidays. Um, September, you know, November, December, are typically not the most active times. And they don't, especially with the market slowing down, they don't want to put it out there now and have it look like it's sitting in there for three months when it comes to January. Um, is there, I mean, I, it's sound logic from where I'm, you know, from my perspective, but is there any type of objection, any kind of, um, objection handling to that, that might be able to get them to move down? I mean, it, it does make sense to a certain degree, but I do have a quite a few people that are kind of waiting till like January, February, um, okay. to make their move. Out of curiosity, so, David, what, what general location are you in? Uh, I am in Long Island, New York, guys. Okay, so we got New York. We're going to wait until the spring comes. I've Back written down from the chat box. Say it again. Oh, go ahead. Should, should I write it down? You can say it, Mike. Go for okay. it. Okay. Uh, I've been getting a lot of people going from FOMO, fear of missing out, to FOBAT, fear of buying at the top. And we're going to wait and see, see what happens. You know, same kind of thing. Like, get a lot of people. We're going to wait a little bit, even though everything I'm talking about is buy now, buy now, buy now. We'll wait. So that was so elegantly put. I think I might steal that, Mike. It, all the conversations that we've had, you have not yet said from FOMO to FOBAT. That needs to be branded on a shirt or something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is good. Okay. So absolutely. I'm seeing that several times in the chat box in various uh, renditions as well. I'm seeing we're going to wait till the prices go down. They're going to drop by 20%, right? Interest rates, I'm seeing that in the chat box. I'm seeing midterm elections. We're going to wait until after midterm elections show up. Price is going to come down. We already said that. Someone said they're getting some commission objections specifically. Any other objections? I have been getting uh, a couple of object objections to where they don't even want to talk to me. They're just, don't call me. Expi and I never had that reaction from an expired in years where they are just, do not call me. Do not bother with, and they're very angry. Okay. Out of curiosity, are those recent expireds or old expireds? New. New expireds are really ticked off. And I where are you out of, Tracy? A New Jersey. New Jersey. Down at the, um, we're at, I'm at the shore. 
Yep. And Mike, I didn't ask you, where are you out of Mike? Putting you on the spot. Denver, Denver yeah. Colorado. Yep. Any other serious objections that you guys are getting? And I really want you to dig deep because sometimes some of what I'm hearing is it's an objection that we aren't even recognizing is an objection. What the heck do I mean by that? Sometimes I'm hearing people say, well, they said that they were just going to hang tight. We're not digging any deeper. It's probably an objection. So can I stick that one down just as a general as well? We're just going to hang tight for a bit. So okay. I'm, I'm going to talk about that. Perfect. I want to talk about that. Mary. In fact, that's actually where I'd like to start. Is how, do, how do we know what, what's an objection? Um, while we're waiting for him to hop back in. Objection versus condition. Are we cool with that as a starting point, first and foremost? Because is it fair to say, and maybe I'm just speaking out of term here, is it fair to say that some of us have moved away from truly digging in to figure out if it is an objection or if it is a condition? So uh, as, as, the, as the objections were starting to come in, the first thought that I had was, what, like, are we, um, are we really talking about an objection here? And how do we know? How do we know that it's an objection? And what's the definition? And so, um, so as the as the chief sales officer here, um, my 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 sales guys are going to come in. A couple of them are virtual as well right now on on this because this is a conversation we have all the time. And so, um, I, I, let me just should I introduce myself, Leah? Please, yeah. Who the heck are you? Okay, who am I? So I'm a retired maps coach. <laughs> Um, so I'm a reti retired maps coach. I was a maps coach for a couple of years, worked alongside Leah. We have uh, awesome friendship and, and, uh, and uh, we, um, I, I left maps to take the position of becoming the chief sales officer here. And when I say here, here is integrity first home buyers, which is um, a large residential real estate investment group here in South Central Pennsylvania. And we buy and sell um, to the tune of, <clears throat> uh, to the tune of, We'll probably do 450 deals this year, maybe 500, depends on how the end of the Q4 shakes out. Um, uh, and so we are essentially built the same way that you would build a mega team, except our exit strategy is instead of just taking the listing, and I say just, I, I ton of love and respect for retail real estate. Um, instead of just taking the listing, our exit strategy is to acquire the property and then sell it, right? Or, or to acquire the property and, and drop it into a portfolio. Does that make sense? Are we good with that? Okay. So it, as the chief sales officer, I would say that the closest uh, analogy to my day-to-day -day would be the rainmaker. Okay. So I'm responsible for driving the opportunities in at the top of the funnel. And I'm responsible for coaching and leading our team on the sales side of the thing uh, of the organization to, um, to maximize our conversion rates and, um, and, and to, to create the revenue. So I, 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 I look at my job and say that my main responsibility is to be responsible for revenue. Um, and if you're a rainmaker for a team, I would, and that's not on your job description, I would add it because uh, it's a high level of accountability when you think of it like that. So here's Garrison. Here's one of my, he's actually a virtual buyer. We've started to buy virtually in, in multiple markets. Um, and he's also comes from uh, um, our lead management department, which we would call ISAs, right? So ISA or lead management. So, uh, so we have Garrison here and Mitch who was sitting there. Um, and then a couple of my, my folks are, are virtual online right now. So, so we talk about this all the time. Right. And, and and just to give you some some perspective, our conversion rates suck compared to your conversion rates. So the conversion rates for uh, the conversion rates for investment versus retail real estate is dramatically different. Um, we have a much lower conversion rate of of, uh, of uh, appointment to contract. Right. Because we're only going to be able to buy a small percentage of the opportunities we generate. And so to put that scale in perspective, uh, our target is 175 appointments set per month. And we want to attend 80% plus of those really targeting 90%. Okay, so it's 175 set appointments per month and then targeting attendance of 80% of or better. And we, uh, we would like to acquire uh, 40 properties a month. Okay, so, so just, just for some framework of like what, what we do, okay? So um, if, if we want to we want to go on, we want to set 175 appointments and get 40, the gap there is skill. Okay, so there's only two things you can control in the business: it's skill 
or activity. All right. So we have no question about activity. We, we, we hustle here. Hustle is probably a, a, the thing we do best. Um, and then skill is really where you make your conversions and that's where the money's made. So, um, so this conversation today is about skill. Gary just shared at the uh, OP meeting last week, and, and I'm an OP by the way in Pittsburgh, so um, KW through and through here. Um, so um, Gary shared at the OP meeting, we're heading into a skill-based market. And so that timing couldn't have been better because here I, here I am with you guys a week later, and then Leah and I set this up several weeks ago, and it's a skill-based conversation. And we're five years that the mega agent needs to have, and it's regenerate, we follow up, go and negotiate contracts, and in the 2021, wiggle your phone. Something went weird with the audio for a split second there. Wiggle your phone. You and were going to get messed up. How about now? Are we good? Is it still a little chunky for you guys? Yeah, I can't hear it. Yep, it went robo mode. I got rid of the Wi Fi. How are we? Weird, weird robo voice. You guys are the voice to me, too. Leah, I think it's going to be his earbuds are dying or going out. Ah, good tip there. Do you have earbuds in, Joe? I do. Might be that those are dying. Look at us, tech whizzes. See, we can all come together to figure it out now. We'll get there. All right, I'm going to try the external again. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's good. Okay, that's this again. So we'll see. Let me know. I'll keep my phone alive in case we need to hear that. Okay. Um, so last year. Okay. Um, okay. So. Uh, all right. So let's talk about condition versus rejection. And I apologize for not being uh, technical. There's also some background noise. I don't know if it's through the window, maybe. No, there's just like 14 people on the other side of that wall that are yelling. Grinding. Um, yeah. So a, uh, and that's why I had the earbuds in. So a, a condition versus an objection. So let's dive into that. So a, how do we know it's an objection? Because you're hearing things like, I don't want to do, I don't want to make a deal now. I don't want to, I want to wait till after the election. I want to, like, none of those are, like, none of those have to do with real estate, right? So where, where's it coming from? And so I'm going to walk you guys through a process before we even talk about this specifically, because to be honest with you, none of those specifics are really the, the point. Um, what's the point is how do you systematically figure out how to communicate with the customers and be able to serve them at a high level? And, th and this is actually regardless of whether it's about price, timing, or whatever. Um, it's it's how, are we, how are we having those language skills? So I actually have it written right up here, which is, you can kind of see it right here, which is an objection handler. So I'm going to give you a four-step process that you can use that'll tell you whether you're dealing with an objection or a condition, all right? And before, I, before we go through the four steps, I'm going to give you the definition. An objection is based on perception. A condition is a reality that exists. Now... To, 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 back, to back that, we know that every customer needs to be three things. They need to be ready, willing, and able, right? So all of the conditions or objections that, you're, that you guys were giving, right, uh, election or whatever, those are all related to, is this customer ready, willing, and able to do business? So if we're using that as the framework for what we're talking about, then everything from that point forward, we have, we have universal de uh, definition. And everything as we move forward should be should should be with that framework. Okay. So the first step, if you're going to go through the four step, we're going to dive in. First step is identify. Now, when you hear somebody say something like, "I want to wait for the midterm election," what's a question you could ask that would identify what's really going on there? Why is that important to you? Mitch said why, and you said why. It's why, right? And, and, and not just why, but like what's significant about the election? This is a great way to change. This is, this is me going back to maps days. Leo, if Leah ever does this to you guys, I'm sorry. Instead of asking why, ask what's significant. 
Yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely. So why the election? Uh, as children, and, and actually this book right here, which is never split the difference, talks about this. But as children, we get uh, uh, reprimanded by why often. So we create a negative emotional response to the word why. If you ask what's significant, uh, it changes that connotation. So, so okay, so what's significant about the midterm election for your real estate needs? And if they give some Fox News answer or NPR answer or whatever, it doesn't really matter, right? It's like, okay, so you, you shared with me that you needed to move to Illinois for such and such reason. How does that change with the midterm election, yes. right? Which actually goes to step two, which is to clarify. So identify is, identify is the first one, which is like, what's going on there? What, what are we really talking about? And, th and that, that's not a bad question to ask. So like, you, 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 brought up, you brought up the election, like what are we really talking about here in relation to your real estate needs, right? Yeah. And that's different than clarify. Because clarify is where you start to figure out like what's what, what how that's attached to the transaction. Because like the identify is, and we we see this often, the smoke and the fire. You'll hear somebody say, "I'm worried about the midterm elections." That's the smoke, and the fire might be, "I'm unsure about the financial implications of the midterm elections." So the smoke is the, is the election and the fire is the financial impact. And how does that financial impact come into play? It's going to be, I'm worried that the market's going to, going to bomb out. Now I'm dealing with oh, that, right? Or I'm worried about interest rates or whatever, right? So like, again, and those are human concerns of like the market condition or whatever's going on there. That, may, that makes sense, right? So the identify is I, I'm hearing you talk about the election, right? But there's got to be something else to that. So what is that? And then you, you, once you dig in, then you can clarify. Ah, so what I'm hearing you say, and this is where you kind of restate it and understand whether this is a finite thing or, right, with, is this a reality or is this a perception? So, because if you go, if you, if they come out with, like, well, we're just going to stick on the election one because it's not controversial at all and nobody's hearing it. So we're going to say, so what I'm hearing you say is that you're worried about the financial implications that the election might bring. And so your, your intentions are to wait to see how that plays out. Am I hearing you correct? Now what we've done is we've clarified because we've restated and that clarification gives us the information we need to move forward. Is that, are we good now? We're tracking through one and two? Does anybody have any questions about what we what we covered with one and two so far? I'm seeing a lot of hands going like this, it looks like. So I think we're, I think we're good. Okay, all right. Yeah. We had to get through the choppiness. Now it's, now it should be worth it. Okay, so one and two, identify, clarify. The third one, is kind of the fun one. So once we've done that, now we're starting to get a feel for, is this an objection or is this a condition? Because he, here's an example of how the election might show up as smoke, the fire is finances, and the condition versus objection could be, I can't sell, it, like absolutely cannot sell with the values dropping because I just bought last year and I'm, I'm maxed out on equity. I have zero equity left. Is that a condition or an objection? That's a reality. So it's a condition. Or it's I don't, I moving isn't important enough to me to be willing to risk whatever the finances are that's going on right now, which would be an objection, right? Which means that we they're, they're, it's a perception that the market conditions are not are not going to match their needs, right? And and they still might not be ready, willing, and able to move. It might be unsolvable, right? If you want to think of it that way. So the third step is explore boundaries. And this is where your skill set, your scripted role play practice uh, is, is going to be um, extremely fundamental. Because the questions that you ask at this stage are going to be critical. By the way, at no point between first, second, or third steps did you hear fix it. So stop trying to rescue, fix, or overcome something until you understand it. And so at step three, when you're exploring the boundaries, that's just understanding. Um, again, what are the ranges of comfort that we're dealing with here? 
So I heard you talk about the election, and what we really clarified was that we were talking about the, the financial concerns. And hey, listen, I'm a human being living in the same country, getting bombarded by the same news channels you are, so I can appreciate that, right? Empathy now. What, what I want to know is when, when do you make the decision that you're absolutely not going to sell? So I'm exploring a lower boundary. So in the shift book, right, also here, right, we train on this all the time. We train on the six connecting questions, right, guys? Mm -hmm. Yes. We train on the six connecting questions, and we also train, uh, we also talk all the time about the decision-making continuum, right? Does anybody know what that looks like? Can anybody picture it in their mind? What's it look like? What's at the top? Absolute? Yes or no. Yes or no. You just gave them both. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely should be. Absolute. It's absolute yes and absolute no, yeah. right? And everything in between is the decision-making continuum. So exploring boundaries is when you have the chance to kind of press people out to the outer edges of that. So if you heard my question, which was, hey, when does it absolutely not make sense to move forward with the real estate transaction based on the results of the election? That we're taking them to the lower boundary, which then gives them an off ramp, right? And it also, everything that they answer from that point forward is relative to an absolute no. And the reverse you can do, although psychology of sales would tell you that if you take people to an absolute yes, you have to be careful because it can feel like a hard press close. So we, we, I'd prefer to do like, hey, if you could draw the perfect scenario for me, what would that look like? Right. And then they have the freedom to draw their perfect outcome. And that's an absolute yes. Does that make everybody tracking with that? So exploring the boundaries, you can't do it too soon because you haven't identified and clarified yet. And you don't know, like you're going to just start to throw out these absolute yes, absolute no. And if they if you haven't let them bring to the surface what their true fear is, and you give them an absolute no really early, they're going to take that off ramp and they're going to say, well, you know, Good Morning America told me the market's down 35%. I, you're right. I shouldn't sell. And you're like, I didn't say that. I just asked a question. But you gave them such a quick off ramp without clarifying it that, that it's going to be too easy for them. Okay. So you got to, you have to identify, you have to clarify. And at, clar at clarity, you get that you can create empathy. Okay, and then now we, we, we know that logic makes people think and emotion makes people act. So once we bring out the emotional significance behind the words that they share, then we have the ability to really work with them on that. Okay. All right. So after we identify, after we clarify, and after we explore boundaries, the last step is say it louder offer hope. Offer hope. You could call it a close. And it should be a close if it's in the right place in the conversation. And sometimes it's a conditional close. Like if we took care of blank, what would it make sense to move forward? Right? Can anybody stop the elections? Don't even go there. But could, could right? Like it's not, we're not changing that. So you can't say if there were no elections, would you move? Don't do that. Right. But but you could say, hey, so if you were if you were confident that your move was more important than who's in the in the uh, Senate seat, right? At that point, what's your decision? What what do you do at that point? Do you move or do you not move? So we and then we can say, okay, oh, you do move, great. And then we can offer hope. I think based on what we're hearing here, that there is an outcome that could work for you, and it is blank, right? And that might that might lead you down the path of a close, but you don't want to close. So so you have to be careful that you're not closing your entire sales process on just one objection, because if you do that and you leave other objections that you're not talking about on the table, then you're just setting yourself a landmine that you're going to step on later because they're going to say, well, I I also need to make sure my husband's on board. And you're like, oh my God, I didn't ask that question, right? I didn't ask my six connecting questions. I left something else on the table. There's a whole other thing that could kill the deal and I didn't go there, right? So, so you, you handle each of the objections and there, there's an old school way of thinking about objections where it's like isolate and overcome, right? Which sounds very much like a, like a strategy of war, right? We're gonna isolate and overcome. 
And, and I don't know about you, but like when I'm making an important decision on a on potentially my largest asset, I don't want to feel overconfident. I want to feel seen and heard, and I want clarity on what I'm doing, and I want to be guided in the right direction. Is that fair? Are we good with that? So, so the language choice that we use around all of this is super critical. Um, and if this sounds like it's like way over the top intense about the way that we treat language skills, I would argue that if you're not heading in this level of intentionality, if you as a, if you're a solo agent or running a team and you're not having conversations like this, people like us who are are going to make it harder for you. So, dude, because we can have a conversation in a hard market and uncover those emotional things that make a difference that will help create transactions where otherwise they might not have. And this is where like you have a conversation with somebody, they give you the, I'm not sure, I'm not ready, maybe, maybe not. And you're like, okay, well, I'll call you in three months. And two months later, you see it on the market. And we're like, ah, oh. right? So this is, this is the difference because you can control that outcome to a much higher degree if, you're, if your skills of language are, are at the top of the game. So, um, so the, re and the reason I have the books here is because I'm, I'm going to give you those recommendations. Uh, uh, this book is an easy recommendation, right? GK. Um, it's, it, if you're not reading the book shit and we're going into potentially a monumental shift, what are you reading right now that's more important? Um, so there's that book. And then the two other books that I have there are Never Split the Difference and the book that I affectionately call The Little Black Book and it's Exactly What to Say by Phil Jones. Cool. And this is a phenomenal language skills book, both for leadership and also for sales. And I highly recommend it. I actually like the regular book more than I like the exactly what's to say for real estate agents, which there is that other version out there. If you have it, that's cool. I'm not talking down on it. I just happen to like the general version a little bit more because I think the skills are a little broader. Um, and I just happen to like it. Joe, did you just uh, interview Phil? Uh, more like, uh, we had a chat. <laughs> yeah. So I, I happen to, um, I happen to have some, 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 uh, common connections with him and, uh, and yeah, we ended up on a, on a 45 minute call on uh, Monday. Yeah. So super genius, super smart guy. Um, and, uh, and he, and he knows that the skills in this book are what this economy needs right now. So, is that something, out of curiosity, did you guys talk business or did you just talk for fun? It was a little of both. It was a little was of there both. a gemstone that you could pull out of that conversation that the rest of the group needs to know about? Uh, so we talked about a couple of things. We talked a lot about the community um, because one of the things that led us to that inner, that conversation was potentially uh, working together. And, and he's, he's got a community of exactly what to say that's really growing. Um, so most of that would not be relevant. But one thing that he did say was that he's, he's been going through the curriculum of the book over and over again, and that he realized that it didn't matter how good the person was who was presenting the material because the material in the book was so good that even presented moderately or like maybe below moderately, it was still so good that it, that it rang true. Um, and that's to me was like, yeah, I, I totally, that's a gem. Like the book, the, the material is so good. It's very simple and simplicity is a little dangerous because we think then that it's dumb. Right. But it's like, it's, it's, we call it, we call it things like, like literally the chapter of this, this, uh, chapter 16 is what happens next. And all you're doing is creating a, what happens next in every conversation that you leave off. I'll read the quote, like, look, the words are enormous. Like, this is not physics okay it says it is your responsibility to lead the conversation and following the sharing of required information your role is to move it towards a close so simple but do we how often do we leave a conversation we talk about this all the time always have a next step right so like how often do you leave a conversation and it's left with like some kind of weird awkward vagueness about when are we going to talk next and who's going to initiate that and what's our goal with that next communication right what can I what can I do between now and that next time? So when we talk on November 15th, 
that I'm that it's a valuable call for you, right? The, the little stuff like that that's in this book that just goes a really long way. So, so the gem is just get the dang book. Get the dang book. Okay. Yeah. If you're in my schedule, don't get the dang book because it might show up on your doorstep anyway. Just just. <laughs> okay. Um, let's go back then for a split second. Sorry, I took us down that rabbit hole, but you you said the book, and I I remembered seeing that picture that you had posted. Um, so the four step process, we've got identify, clarify, explore boundaries and offer hope. I'm assuming that the gentlemen that are in the office with you here, or perhaps there's someone on the phone that would also like the phone, the call that would also like to play around with this. I, I think it would be beneficial to see this modeled. Is that something you'd be willing to do? <laughs> Garrison's like, oh man, I mean, I'm happy to do uh, we do it all the time. So I'm happy to do it. Like, that's why he laughed because he knows. But I'm happy, and sorry, uh, I'm happy to do it with anybody who wants to who wants to role play it. All right, team. So if anybody who shared one wants to do it, I'll I'll do it with you, and uh, you can you can object or have a condition. You can decide is it fixed or is it is it movable, and um, and I'll tackle it with you. So let me clarify so that you're hearing this carefully. All of you that are sitting there going, yeah, 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 this four-step process, sure, sounds cool, sounds great, yet Joe must not actually be on the phones hearing these objections day in, day out, right? And I'm going to stump him, or I really want to hear how this would go if I were that real pain in the ass, <laughs> right, buyer, how would this sound? Now is your chance to play that buyer or seller. Yeah, bring it. It's tough. My guys say it's tough. I'll let him be the call. He's going to be the agent. You don't even have to play the yeah. agent. You're just being the pain in the butt. You're just, you're, I, I'm waiting. No, I'm not going to sell. I'm not going to move. Who wants to go? I'll jump in. All right. <laughs> so I started it. So. We'll start it at you. You, you tell me a reason why we're not going to move forward and I'll pick it up right from there. Okay. I don't want to put my house on the market right now. We're going into the holidays and isn't this a slower time? Okay. Hey, I, I appreciate it. So are you, um, just share with me, are you, are you telling me that at this point you, you don't want to sell or are you just saying that you're not sure it's the right time? I want to sell it, um, but I hear the market's slow and if it doesn't sell uh, this month or next, it's going to look like it's sitting there a long time um when really it's just the market okay is it is it is it about the is it about the market or about your personal timeline it's about the market okay so what are your what fears do you have around the market news is saying that uh uh sales are down there's more inventory uh, it's taking longer to sell and if I put it on the market now and sits there yeah. for two months because of seasonality, mm -hmm. uh, it looks like it's sitting on the market for three months when in actuality it's the season. Okay. Are you, are you looking for certainty with when you sell or you just want to make sure that you're making the best decision? I want to make sure I'm making the best decision. Okay. How will you know that you are making the best decision? <laughs> I guess there's, that's why I'm asking you is, yeah. is, would, would this be, would it be detrimental for me to sell the house right now while the market is slow because of seasonality mm -hmm. um, versus waiting until after the holidays? Well, and I appreciate that. And, and, and I, I'd, I'd like to be a resource for you here, right? So we have, we essentially have two choices. We can list the property now or we cannot, right? So if, if we don't list it right now, we have a 100% chance that it doesn't sell, correct? That's true. Okay. And if we do list it now, we're worried about the unknowns of the future market. Is that right? Correct. Will there ever be a time that we're sure 100% of what the future market will look like? No. Okay. So... So if, if, if we can sell it, if we can list it now and we, and we have the certainty that we're in the driver's seat or we're always going to be wondering the what ifs, um, help, me, help me understand how, like, because 
listen, the market it, right now, it, it is what it is. And we've looked over the statistics, right? So we have that, we have that in our back pocket. We have the certainty of what, what, what we know about that. We have the uncertainty of the future, regardless of when that is, right? I'm, I'm just asking you, if we listed it today, right? And we gave the market our best shot, regardless of what that shot is, and we sold the property and achieved your other goals, would you would that would that work for you? Is that what you want? That would be fantastic. Okay. Well, the only way we're going to get there is if we move forward with our best shot for the listing, right? So do you want to talk about what that would look like? Well, that would mean I could move uh, out to um, Boston. You know, where my kids are. That's great. Okay. Right. My concern is if it doesn't sell, how does right. that get perceived on the market? Um, you know, uh, in January. Sure. So if we're sold by December, does it matter what the market perceives in January? Nope. That'd okay. Great. Okay. Okay. I just, I just make it like, so I, I just, I, there's, we're, we're going to talk about a bunch of unknowns or what ifs there. Right. So I just, for me, the only way that I can see certainty and clarity moving forward is to say that if we did take the shot and we believe we have a, a solid approach to the listing process, that we're putting our best foot forward in today's market. Because if we if we regroup in January and the market is worse, then your 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 desires, the, the things that you shared that were super important to me are only further away at that point, right? And we have the opportunity to put that within our grasp today. Okay. So what should so we do? I have no problem listing the house today. I just know that the longer our house sits on the market, the less it gets looked at. Right. And God forbid it does not sell today and does not sell by next month. Uh, come January, I'm going to be so far down the line, you know, that uh, nobody's going to be looking at this property anymore. Okay. So, so time out. That's good, right? But like, and, and I don't know if you could hear it, but like I'm traveling a little bit between exploring boundaries and continuing to go back to re-clarify with you because when, especially when you're doing it made up, it's like fun to like figure out, to figure out what, what which way you can escape. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm but trying to leave those the <laughs> Right, right, exactly. But in those situations, if you've done a great job of using the who, what, when, where, how, and why of the six connecting questions, what you really want to do is you want to lock back into those things that were super important to them and say, hey, I heard this was really critical to you. And I'm worried that that thing that's really important is going to be left to the side because of the unknowns of whatever else we're dealing with there. And so then testing them. So for you, I was like testing the boundaries of like, well, what if we definitely don't list it today, right? And then we and we and we're banking on that future unknown versus the other way, which was uh, we could list it today. We have that certainty, and it helps you move forward. How do you feel about that, right? I'm just like, kind of testing those outcomes, and then I'm, I'm giving you like conditional offerings of hope. Hey, we could list it today, and you you even you said the words, so like there was a close that was available there because you said we could list it today. That's a close because once that's out of your mouth, I don't have to do the heavy lifting. And then we move forward, right? Because right. then I can say, I can, I, we can just go right back to that and say, so, so as, as you shared, like we can list it today and, and the, the concerns of January, because if, we don't want to, we don't want to play fear monger there because we can do that. We would paint like a really negative future, but we could do what, that, right? We can say, Hey, you know, so if we, if we, if we, right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. But that, that, they're conditioned to hear that the same way that they're going to hear that they're conditioned to hear when you go to the car dealership, that that car is going to be sold by tomorrow. And if it's not sold by tomorrow, you're a liar. And if the market's not terrible in January, you're a liar. So you got to be really careful that you're not trying to do that where you're like pigeonholing some certainty onto them. Does that make sense? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Cool. Yeah, there was a comment in the chat box in the middle of that conversation too that said, uh, what a great time to talk about, Scott said, what a great time to talk about list price importance. Mm -hmm. And I am curious what your guys' take is in this format, in this four-step process, which sounds like it's very driven on getting to the appointment. Do you, do you address the pricing conversation in this initial pre-qualification call or are you saving that for the appointment itself? 
So for the most part, we're leaving the heavy, the heavy lift of price to the in-person. Um, and we're doing that because we want the least amount of conflict early on. Um, but you can't avoid it, right? Really, like Mitch just said, you gotta ask. So you're asking like, so, uh, and the way that we do pricing conversations is kind of cool. Uh, we say, you wanna, you wanna do, so what, how do you ask it? So I'll just ask, first I ask like what they know on the property. And then I'll just say, hey, like just, just wondering uh, out of curiosity, like, what, what kind of price are you looking to get for this property? And most of the time they'll say, you know, looking to get 250 for it. And I'll be like, okay, thanks for sharing that. Um, now, let me ask you, what's a price that you wouldn't take for this property? And then immediately they'll they'll be like, oh, I'll pro I probably can't go I, like 220. From literally just asking one question, they drop 30 grand. And for us, we're looking for that flexibility for you as a, if you're if you're looking to list the property, Having the clarity of what their bottom line is and really like where the pricing intent, like intensity around pricing, um, it, it's, that's really good information. So, um, and, and as an agent, by the way, regardless of whether, like for us, like our strategy is to acquire the properties, but if you're looking to list the property, always go off of what's in their pocket, right? Because the perception of, of the gap there between the list price and, the, and what's, what's hitting their pocket, like again, lots of weeks you think emotion makes you act. The, the, risk price is a much more logical thing. The amount of money that they walk away that's going to change their family's life is an emotionally attached financial number. So make sure that you're going, even if you say like, you know, because you might say, oh, what's the price you're looking to get for the property? That's That question, by the way, is not specific enough because you don't know whether that's the list price, whether that's the price they need to walk away with. You don't know what the mortgage, you, you have no idea, right? So so get detailed, right? What what um, if I do an amazing job for you, by the way, painting that picture perfect of your you being a part of their success. So if, if, if I do an amazing job for you as a listing agent, how much money does that put in your pocket? And then that number helps to drive your listing conversation. And then you, then you actually go right back to ready, willing, and able. And you ask yourself, is this person really willing to participate in this market? And are they able to sell in this market and achieve what they want to achieve? Uh, because you might find that the price is the thing that they're not ready, willing, and able on. And, and that could become, that could go from an objection to a condition in those situations. Um, and, and you have to be okay getting a well-qualified no, right? To get a well-qualified no is actually just as valuable for you and your time as getting a half-assed yes, where then you go out and you think you're chasing a listing and you're not like you're, 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 and you're just going to leave them feeling not so great about that. So is that helpful? I thought I saw Scott say he liked that. So, but is that, is that helpful to think of it that way for pricing? I just want to say one thing on your credit. One something that helped me a lot that um, you guys Josh was a little off. I'm a little off screen. Hey, everybody. Um, so one of the things that 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 really helped me, and I I never really got this until Mitch actually put it on the table was once they give you that number that they're quote unquote you know shooting for, just simply asking them how they got to. <laughs> you know, how do you find that number? It's hilarious to see some people try to justify this outrageous number they gave you. And then sometimes they'll just start putting their own limbs down, you know, and sort of putting their, uh, you know, putting their guard down. So that's just something I found to be, to be a little help in my success. This is such a good point. Such a good point there. Yeah. Okay, so now we've got the four points. Was there anything out around those four points? Because I've been cutting you off and interjecting here that we, that you did not get to address that you wanted to make sure to talk about. Uh, not specifically, like, you know, it, it's um, uh, practice it because you don't want to practice on the customer. Um, you want to, you want to practice going through it. And, and honestly, like it's practice on kids. Uh, practice on who? Kids. My seven year old is great at objections. Uh, not great once I identify and clarify. Um, so so it, it really helps to, to work you through what looks like it could be a conflict. Um, so just pra practice it because, you know, even the role play that we just did where we, and again, role plays are a little dangerous because 
you'll you'll get so excited about trying to avoid the like, getting cornered. So your customers probably won't be as evasive. They they may end up tripping into, and I don't want to say we're tricking them, but they may end up tripping themselves out of what they thought was an objection much easier than when they're like really committed to dodging you. Because then at some point you just have to say, like, this sounds like this is absolutely a deal killer for you. And I don't want to try to fix something that's not fixable. I can't fix the market and I can't fix that it's October and you want to sell in January. Right. So what should we do today? Because I don't want to, I don't want to make it uncomfortable for you. And I don't want, I want the best, I want you to have an amazing experience. And if, and if I need to sell your house in October and you always wanted to sell it in January, neither of us is going to feel good. And by the way, that make that takeaway might just be the thing that they slide right back into. So, um, but you can only do that. I and mean, you have to earn the right to do that because that's, that requires bravery. Something that he talks about and never split the difference, but there's, there's essentially like a little bit of bravery that's required in some of those exchanges. And, and some of these things that feel counterintuitive to us when we really, we are emotionally attached to that outcome of getting the listing or getting the deal. And we're with uh, that, that leads us that predisposes us to maybe not be brave enough to step back and say, at what point do we say this is not a deal? Out of curiosity, and that's that's so killer because I do think that we can oftentimes it's that like I'm going to sit on this batch of eggs until it hatches, but the eggs may be completely rotten, right? Um, out of curiosity, going back up to the very top of the call where you mentioned that your goal is to set 175 appointments in order to get 40 properties a month. This is a little bit off topic, but I'm curious, where do you go to find, and I know this is a complicated answer for you, so I'm setting you up for an interesting answer. Where do you go to speak to, I'm assuming way more than 175 people to set 175 appointments to get 40 properties signed? Where do sellers hide? We go to all those places. Uh, we have um, we have what we call our core four lead sources, um, and most of them are very expensive. So we're not a great model for you. Um, we use TV heavily. We use a lot of PPC, web SEO. Uh, we use direct mail at a scale that would be yes. intimidating, most likely, um, for you to hear about. But uh, that's where that's where we're going. But the reality is, we're and we also buy data. Like we use data science. To, to stack motivational triggers. All that to say, you can do most of that at a lower scale, at lower cost, as long as you're willing to put the sweat equity in. So if you think like the things that we talk about with our data science calls, like the fancy triggers and socioeconomic reasons that people sell, divorce, death, tax liens, pre-foreclosures, right? Well, guess what? Those are all publicly available. We just happen to pay a, an aggregator to get those. So go to those places because that's where a lot of the motivation comes from. Um, and you can do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, then, and we do we do outbound efforts, very, very TCPA. We have like, they, these guys know I'm, I'm very risk averse. So, you know, we're scrubbing and making sure we're very careful about it. We do it manually. So we're not doing, re re you know, remote uh, or uh, the uh, voicemail drops or any of that type of stuff that can really get you into trouble. But we do outbound because we once we find very very targeted lists that are high like have every indication that there should be high level of motivation if they don't respond to our uh, marketing efforts and then we and then we maybe send them a letter and we don't get a response back but we really really want to get in touch with them we will go on the hunt for them um, so I you know use that at your own discretion. Okay, what else? We've got a good five minutes left here. We've gotten the bulk of how we're overcoming these objections or determining are they objections or conditions. We've got the, the goods on where Joe is getting this information from. As genius as he may be, it sounds like it's pretty much all pulled out of these three books. Yes? Right? Yeah, yeah. Which is great because what that means, and Joe, and I say this with all the love in my heart, it means that you don't have to be as genius as Joe. You just need to do the work and practice the skills to have the same results, right? That's always good to know. Um, we know where he's getting the business. And to his point, while he's maybe doing it on a massive scale, this is completely doable at the scale of whatever, you know, your level is. Uh, 
pay-per-click. We can do that through Speculo Group. We've had them on to talk before TV. That's up to your own discretion, but there's other things that we can do around that. Direct mail, I've got a ton of people already doing that and buying data or, or sourcing data that's totally doable as well. The mm -hmm. book title, Scott, were Shift, obviously, Never Split the Difference, and Exactly What to Say. Yep, Never Split the Difference, Exactly What to Say, and Shift. So in the five minutes we have left, what is Joe not saying that you feel like he's keeping that's making him the genius that you need to know to be the genius? Uh, Mike, I can answer that question about 72 sold. Their model is basically a very, very similar model to ours. So um, without giving any judgment of them or, or the program itself, um, I, I, they're, on the surface, I would be attracted to it. Um, that, that, is, that is effective. Um, and uh, um, it's, it's very similar to what we do locally. So I'm, I'm actually interested to see when they, when they come locally because we'll probably be competing in the similar space. So, um, you know, we our, our TV budget is $50,000 a month. So um, it's, it's going to get competitive. Uh, and what we, we, we have done what Gary taught, which is take market share and then squeeze out the people that are in those spaces. We've done that strategically in each of our lead source categories. So PPC, we've edged ourselves up. TV, we've edged ourselves up. And when everybody dropped down, we would grab more and grab more because it's hard to take it away once you get it. So um, yeah, the one thing I will tell you guys is all that to be said, our number one conversion source is referral. So uh, for all the fancy ways that we spend our money um, on the shiny bells and whistles of lead generation, we also send edible arrangements to every real estate agent that sends us a referral. We also have uh, tons of energy put around the, the, the two-way communication with the, with the most valuable lead sources that we've got. So, you know, um, it, we, we know, I, I know down to the percentage exactly which lead sources converted what. Our target is 10% lead to a contract, right? Referrals 22% year to date. So outbound text or outbound call is like four. Facebook is like two or three. So um, direct mail tends to be right around 10%. So effectiveness wise, you know, uh, direct mail does, is probably a, a safe, safe ish bet. Make sure your message is really great. There's another book that we use called the uh, building a story brand. Donald Miller, he's spoken with Gary before. Um, he was a speaker for what was that? Leah mega camp maybe, or one of the um, masterminds. Masterminds, I believe. Yeah. But um, we use that. We use that. Every single lead funnel that we're building, we do a story brand model exercise around it. So if we want to talk to realtors, we ask, what's the avatar? How do we make them the hero? If we're, we want to talk to sellers, it's the same. If we want to talk about building our buyers list, we build another funnel. We do another story brand exercise. So we, we constantly do that because you, your message and method, which is from Shift, your message and method have to match your audience. And the number, way, number one way we do that is through the story brand model. Two minutes. What's your burning desire to ask or to share? All right. Joe, I appreciate how simple you keep it. I knew that there was going to be, if, if we were bringing you in to talk about something, that it was going to be simple and applicable. And that's what's going to be so important here. It's not some, I need some big, fancy, you know, doohickey script. It's understanding the steps to having an effective conversation to move people forward or to understand that they're not moving forward. Um, really appreciate that. Um, last chance. Everyone loves it. Beautiful. Thank you for putting up with the technology glitches on both yeah, sides. Yeah, sorry, guys. Doing it as well. No, not at all. I'm glad you didn't bail on us when the first one went glitchy. Um, really appreciate your teams and participation on that as well. So thank you guys, those on camera and slightly off camera. No <laughs> problem. <laughs> It's nice to meet you guys. <laughs> awesome. All right, Joe, have a great rest of your weekend. You guys as well. We'll see everybody. Thank you. Take care.